Hi gang, here's how to convert an ATX power supply from a PC into a power supply with some USB ports. I'll also show a lot of wiring and construction methods along the way. Initially I needed it for my Raspberry Pi and servo controlled eyeball, so I could run it for two days at a Maker Faire. To get an ATX power supply, I had this old Pentium computer which I take parts from every now and then. Make sure it's unplugged before opening it up. The power supply is this here, and these are the only cables coming from it. Those cables supply power to the motherboard, hard drive, CD drives, and so on. I unplug them all until there's nothing connected anymore. Then I unscrew the power supply from the case. The only screws are on the back, and here it is all removed. Next up is to figure out what all the wires are and do some testing. This big connector is a 20-pin Molex ATX connector. There's also a 24-pin version, and I'll mention some differences between them. When looked at from this orientation, with the latch on top, the pins are numbered this way. And this chart tells you what each pin is for. Note that the wires are also color coded. And all the voltages are for DC. Orange is plus 3.3 volts. Red is plus 5 volts. Yellow is plus 12 volts. Blue is minus 12 volts. And white is minus 5 volts. The blacks are all ground, or common. There are three more pins I should talk about. But first I should mention that the power supply takes two steps to turn on. First you turn on the switch that's on the power supply itself. That puts the power supply in standby mode. At that point there's no power to all the voltage pins we've talked about. However, that does turn on power to pin 9 with the purple wire. It'll have plus 5 volts and around 500 milliamps of current available. Good for having a standby mode LED light up or something. Just connect an LED with a resistor between pin 9 and one of the ground pins. Here I'm using a bit of 16 gauge wire to plug into the pin. Then comes the LED. And here I'm using a 220 ohm resistor. And then I plug the other end of the circuit into pin 7, one of the ground pins. Switching it on into standby mode turns on the LED. In standby mode, the green wire, which is pin 14 on the 20 pin connector, or pin 16 on the 24 pin connector, will have plus 5 volts. That's where you put the switch for turning on the power to the rest of the pins. The pin numbers might be better to go by than the wire colors though, because in my case, pin 14's wire is gray. The third other pin is pin 8, which is supposed to be gray, but on mine is green. It has plus 5 volts when the power is stabilized for all the pins. That's another good place for an LED, indicating that this time the power supply is fully on. Again I use a resistor to protect the LED. I turn on the standby switch, and it's in standby mode. I turn on the power switch, and the power on LED lights up. If you have a newer power supply, then the LED might not light up. I'll talk about a trick you may have to do in a minute. On the 24 pin connector there are also extra pins for plus 12 volts, plus 3.3 volts, plus 5 volts, and ground. Remember, I said that if you have a newer power supply, then the power on LED may not light up. Many power supplies won't turn on unless they see a computer or a load. To get it to turn on without a load, one trick is to supply a dummy load. And a simple way to do that is to get a 10 ohm resistor, rated for 5 or 10 watts. Connect it to the voltage which is rated for the highest power. Looking at the back of my power supply, the plus 5 volt supplies up to 110 watts, and the plus 12 volt supplies up to 132 watts. So I'll connect it to the plus 12 volts, since 132 watts is the highest. Now when you turn on the switch with no other loads, the power on LED should light up, and there should be power to all the pins. I'll talk more about this dummy load later when installing it. Next, I needed some USB ports for supplying 5 volts. I needed that for my Raspberry Pi for controlling this eyeball. And I'm using a Micro Maestro 6 channel servo controller board for the eyeball's servo motors. It runs off of 5 volts too, so I made up a custom power cable for it which has a USB connector on the end. I go back to the old computer from which I'd salvaged the power supply and remove a USB expansion card from it. Here's the writing on the card. I connect both of its ports to one of the plus 5 volt pins and ground pins and then plug in the Pi and Maestro boards. The eyeball works great. The next step is to make the board smaller and mountable. I start by removing the metal bracket. Then I very carefully cut the unused part of the board, which had room for optional ports. I then drill a hole where it won't damage any important circuitry. Next I mark where to drill and cut to make smaller brackets. I drill and then cut out the brackets. I was worried that if I mounted a metal bracket where my hole was, that I'd short something out. So I cut some insulating plastic from a plastic lid and drill a hole in it. I decide to put one on either side of the board. Finally I attach the small brackets. 
Time to test the modified USB board. The modified USB board still works. Time to make the power supplies case and mount everything. Normally you'd have a boxy case like this, which you can just add switches and binding posts to. There's plenty of room inside. But the one I have like that supplies only up to 200 watts. And my smaller, irregularly shaped one can do 400 watts. So I have to build up around it. I decide to extend the case upward in the back, but keep most of this metal here in place to maintain the cooling airflow inside. I open the case. Be careful if you do this. Make sure it's unplugged. There are capacitors here which can shock you. It's best if you leave it off a few hours or days first while they discharge. I next figure out the wiring. Notice that I'm not bothering with minus 5 volts and minus 12 volts, but I am putting fuses. For those fuses, there's a label on the power supply which gives the maximum current ratings. There is a fuse buried down inside the power supply, but I decide to put easier to replace ones. So the fuses are optional. All the many wires will collect at the fuses, and continue from there to the binding posts. The 5 volt binding post also acts as a connection point for the USB sockets, and there's one binding post for ground. Here are all the parts. The ones we haven't seen so far are the fuse holders and fuses, and the binding posts, some of which I'll paint a different color. They all came from local electronics and hardware stores. I start laying out the front panel on paper, and then I draw it out in Blender, a free 3D modeling and animation software I use a lot. Next comes 3D printing it on my CR10 3D printer, and here's the printed panel. I paint two of the binding posts as I planned to, first with the primer, and then with acrylic paint since that's what I had. Then, while it's still easy to do so, I mount the USB ports, the fuses, the LEDs, the switch, and the binding post. Everything fits nicely. Then I drill some holes in the front and bolt the front panel in place. I cut away some of the existing case, making use of good old metal fatigue to get it off. That allows me to put the wires further back. With the front panel on though, the cover is trickier to put on, but I need it for proper airflow over the heat sinks inside. I can get up most of the screws. Before cutting metal for the rest of the case, I draw it all out on scrap poster board and try it out. I think of a few enhancements, but it's good. I'm using this metal from an old microwave oven. I mark it up and cut it out. That takes some carving, but I managed to get it all. Bending it into shape takes two different pliers. Bending it around a table edge, improvising with bits and pieces, bits and pieces and a table, and back to just pliers. Eventually it's all bent, and a test shows it works. Next I mark where to drill holes for screwing it on, and drill the holes. Don't worry, my fingers weren't as close to the drill bit as it looks like. I screw it all on using the screws salvaged from the same computer from which I took the power supply and the USB expansion board. It fits well. Lastly comes connecting the wires inside to all those parts on the front panel. Mostly I'll use ring terminals and disconnects for connecting to the parts. Once again, here's the wiring diagram. I'll start at the bottom of the front panel and work my way up. So the yellow 12 volt wires are first. I need to connect them all to their fuse. I cut them all. And strip the ends. I twist them together. I also cut some heat shrink tubing and slide it on. The blue 16 to 14 gauge disconnects fit tightly onto the fuse connectors. So I strip the plastic from one. I open it up, and I get lucky. All the wires fit inside, and I can crimp the connector over the wires. I solder all the wires to it. Notice how I apply the heat to one end of the wires and the solder to the other end of the connector, causing the solder to flow through the wires. I slide the heat shrink tube over it all, and use a hot air gun to shrink it in place to prevent other wires from accidentally contacting it. I plug it into the fuse. Continuing with the 12 volts, I next need to connect the 12 volt fuse to the 12 volt binding post. For that I'll use a short length of 18 gauge yellow wire. The fuse is rated for 10 amps. Doing a Google search for a wire ampacity table online, I find that 18 gauge wire can handle 20 amps or less. So this wire is fine. I crimp one end of the wire into a disconnect, and the other end to a ring terminal. The disconnect plugs into the fuse, and the ring terminal goes on the binding post. The 12 volt is now done. To use it, someone would plug a banana plug connector into the binding post, or connect an alligator clip, or a ring terminal. Next up from the bottom is the 5 volt fuse and binding post. So I do the same for it, collecting all the red wires, connecting them to a disconnect, and plugging them into the fuse. I then connect the fuse to the bottom middle binding post, but I don't put the nut on the binding post yet, 
since the USB will also have to go there. And then I repeat all that again for the 3.3 volt fuse and binding post. This time it's the orange wires which I connect to the fuse. And then the fuse to the remaining binding post on the bottom. For the ground, there's no fuse. I just need to connect to the binding post. There are 13 black wires because there were a lot of connections in the PC. I don't need that many, so I terminate 9 of them with morettes by first twisting 5 of them together, then twisting on the morette, and finally doing a pull test to make sure it's on well. I do the same for the other 4, and tuck all 9 away. I then put a ring terminal on the remaining 4. Those go on the binding post. I don't put the nut on yet though, since there are more things to connect to the ground binding post. Next up is connecting the USB board to the 5 volt binding post. I like the connector which came with the board. It holds on well. So I cut it, and separate, and carefully strip the wires going to the two 5 volt pins, and the two ground pins. I'm not using the remaining data wires. The wires are too small for ring terminals. So I twist and solder on some 18 gauge wire and add heat shrink tubing. After adding ring terminals I have this. I plug in the connector and put the 5 volt ring terminal on the 5 volt binding post and tighten the nut. I just slip the ground ring terminal onto its binding post loosely since there are still more ground wires to come. That leaves the power switch and the two LEDs. To minimize the number of ring terminals going to the ground binding post, I'll have the ground wire for all three go to the same ring terminal. And so I've prepared some 18 gauge wire like this, with heat shrink tubing covering up where I've soldered them together. One ring terminal is on the common wire, and a disconnect is on another of the wires for the switch. To the other two wires, I've soldered on the 220 ohm resistors, and from there to the short legs of the LEDs. In the diagram, that's all this. Next, I need to make these connections into the power supply. To the long leg of the standby LED, I solder the purple wire, covering the joint with some heat shrink tubing. And to the long leg of the power on LED, I solder what is normally a gray wire, but in my case is a green wire. I cover the remaining exposed metal with connector coating, also known as liquid electrical tape. The LEDs are done. So after temporarily removing the switch to make things easier, I put them in their holes. The standby one on the bottom, and the power on one on the top. I connect the ring terminal to the ground binding post, and tighten on the nut. With the switch back in place, I plug the ground wire disconnect into it. The only other thing left on the diagram is connecting the switch into the power supply. For that, I put another disconnect on what is normally the green wire, but in my case is gray, and plug that into the switch. You'll notice that there are blue and white wires left. Those are minus 12 volts and minus 5 volts, which I'm not using. So I put morettes on them and tuck them away. I also put a tie strap around all the wires to keep them from moving around. You may be wondering, what about the dummy load? That was a trick I showed you with the 10 ohm resistor which you need to add in order to trick the power supply into thinking there's a computer attached so that it'll turn on. My power supply turns on without it though, so I don't need it. But if you did need it, where would you put it? Some of you may have noticed this brown spot that appeared on my poster board after my earlier test with the resistor. That was from the resistor's heat after running the circuit for around 10 minutes. I was lucky I didn't leave it on for longer. However, since you'll likely be using one of these bigger cases, I'd put it inside the case, attached to some metal and in the airflow that would take the heat away. Lastly, some finishing touches. I carefully paint the faces of the raised letters using gesso. Then I put the cover back on. And finally come the fuses. Their amp rating is written on one of the caps. Here it's 20A or 20 amps. I put the fuse in the fuse holder and screw it in place. Other fuse holders may work differently. Time to test the power supply. I plug my Raspberry Pi into one of the USB sockets and the Maestro motor controller into the other one. I plug in the power supply and flip the standby switch to on. The standby LED comes on when I do that. Then I flip the power on switch and the power on LED comes on, and the Raspberry Pi and servo motors come to life. To free up a USB port for something else, and for variety, I make this cable with a USB connector on one end, and banana plugs on the other. I also have this dual USB socket, which I salvaged from an old HP LaserJet printer. I've wired it so that both sockets are connected to each other. That way I can plug the Raspberry Pi into one of its sockets, and then run the cable I made from the other socket to the 5 volt binding post. I leave the Maestro motor controller plugged into a USB socket. It works great. Well, thanks for watching. 
see my YouTube channel for more how-to videos like this. You can support these videos either through Patreon or through a one-time donation. And if you like these videos, don't forget to subscribe, give a thumbs up, share with your social media, or leave a question or a comment below. See you soon!